Let me tell you a few words about the, the, the motivation for that. Uh, that actually started from a, a chapter in the new uh, handbook, for, uh, uh, handbook of Inequality, uh, which, uh, which is uh, edited by uh, Tony Atkinson and Francois Bourguignon, and they asked us to write a chapter on intrahousal inequality. Uh, so it's, it's not only conceptual, it's not only how should we think about intrahousal inequality, it's also how do we, in practice, measure intrahousal inequality in a kind of realistic model. By realistic, I mean we're not going to use a model in which there is only one commodity. Or we're not going to use a model in which all commodities are public or all commodities are private. We, we want to use something that looks a little bit like what reality is like. Uh, OK, the introduction. Now, those, the, the first time I presented this, I was in front of uh, inequality people. So um, the, this slide is relevant for them. It might not be that relevant for this audience because what I'm going to say is something we, we all convinced of. But you know, one thing that, I, that makes me a little bit nervous are statements like, uh, I quote, one third of the increase in inequality between, uh, between 1980 and 2000 is due to the increase in single uh, person families, right? Which is something that you find a lot in the literature of inequality. Now let's take the extreme case. Let, let me take an economy with, in, in which all couples are identical, each of them has an equal, uh, equal to 100. And let me make an assumption that I don't like, that I'm not going to make, and actually all of my talk will be about we, why we should not make this assumption, but that's just for the sake of presentation. Let's assume that there is only one commodity, it's privately consumed, there are no externalities, no economies of scale, whatever. So in each couple, the sum of individual consumption equals the couple total income. So you know, that's the simplest possible case. Actually, it's way too. Now, you would say, what's the inequality in this economy? You would say it's zero. I have a bunch of couples that are identical, zero inequality. Let's introduce divorce. Let's say some divorce. And when, whenever they divorce, the husband gets 75 and the wife, get, the wife gets 25. Now we're in a new situation in which we have couples and then we have singles. Now we have inequality. Now we have poverty. Actually, those, those women are, are poor in the technical sense and so on. Now, this conclusion that before there was no inequality, now there is inequality, before there was no poverty, now there is poverty, is entirely due to one implicit assumption, which is, while those people were married, the divi division of resources between them was 50-50. And of course, there is no reason to make this assumption. From the empirical point of view, we know that it's not the case. And from a theoretical point of view, it's very hard to think of any reasonable model in which there will be bargaining or something like this, in which, if they divorce, he gets 75 and she gets 25. Still, while they are married, they share equally. You know, it's, it, it, it's just, in, it's not even individually rational in this kind of model. Goods goods. Huh? No, that's my point. Goods. You know, I'm going to talk about public good. Here, I'm assuming that everything is private. No, no, that's the point. That, I mean, okay, I mean you're done, that's fine. But just realistic, just as you were saying, it's not realistic because there's only one. This right? is absolutely not realistic. It's just you to know, convince. It's very unrealistic. Oh, well, look, there will, I will give you a list of commodities. Some will be private, some will be public. And I want my technique to apply whatever assumption you're making on this. Now, you're right that I don't want to take a stand to use a method that will be true only if everything is private or if everything is public. So we, we need to think in a, in a, in a say, slightly more, uh, so, but, but the point, actually, the point of all of this is simply, if you will, you're serious about inequality, you cannot uh, afford to just ignore what's going on within the household. Because this, this conclusion that you see published a lot, that inequality has increased a lot over the last 20 years, it, they, they may, be, may be completely flawed. They may simply be due to the fact that while they are married, we're not looking what's, what's going on within marriage. The moment they divorce, it's, it's, it becomes obvious, and we cannot, we, we cannot ignore that. But maybe the inequality was already there. We, we're, we're simply failing to see it. Now. Here are the, the kind of, uh, of problems. The, we, we, uh, when you think about those, those, those kind of, of issues, we have <coughs> conceptual difficulties, and then you have empirical difficulties. Uh, the conceptual issues, they are standard family economic problem, in particular, public goods. 
uh, how do you measure, how do you think of, and more precisely, how do you measure intra-household inequality in the world when they are public good? By the way, that's a question that was initially in the literature on inequality. In other words, there is something that you see in this literature, which is if I compare inequality in, or in, uh, in, uh, in Sweden and in, uh, and in South Korea, for instance, I should take into account that the percentage of public consumption is much larger in Sweden, and that must have an impact. The fact that you have free access to health, education, and so on must have an impact on inequality. So that's something that, in principle, I should not ignore. And in practice, everybody ignores it because, you know, there is no agreement on how to do that, and people just look at the, at the inequality of either income or, cons or private consumption. But that's something that you definitely cannot afford to, uh, to ignore when you have a household, because part of the reason why you have a household is that they are public good. And actually, I would be willing, as, as Raquel said, I would be willing to accept that most of the, most of the consumption is at least partly public. So what do we do? At the end, this will take us to a question which also was implicit in the literature, but now becomes very explicit. What kind of inequality are we interested in? Are we interested in inequality of income, inequality in consumption, or inequality in welfare? And as you will see from a conceptual point of view, there is a kind of strange relationship between them. The relationship, the relationship is even stranger when you think in terms of the second problem, which is measurement. So, First of all, I want a definition or a measure of inequality which is conceptually sound, but I want it to be useful in the sense that I want to use a concept that I can take to data. If I have a concept which is perfect, and, but there is no chance that I will ever be able to identify anything, then it's not very useful. So I have measurement issues. Now, of course, the, 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 the problem is that intra-household allocation is not fully observable, but we've made progresses recently. Uh, so what I'm going to tell you is exactly at some point I will spend some time explaining what's identifiable and what kind of data you need to identify. In all cases, you need, uh, you need a model. You need a model of household behavior. There is no way you can do that without, without a structural model. Uh, I'm going to use a collective model. We need a non-unitary framework. It's very hard to talk about inequality of welfare if you have only one utility function. Uh, we need a, fun a model in which we have a general characterization of what can be identified under which assumption which we have in the collective model, but not in any alternative that I know of. Uh, so the collective encompasses the unitary, the particular case, bargaining, equilibrium, separate sphere, and so on and so forth. Uh, and what, what you will see is that there are some basic concepts of the collective model that have a direct interpretation in terms of inequality. So the roadmap. I will talk about the conceptual framework. I will talk essentially, uh, we don't have much time, so we talk essentially about the public good issue. It could be extended to household production. Uh, we'll not talk about this, but this is feasible. I will present the general model of household decision that I'm going to use, and then I will introduce our main, hopefully, our main contribution to the debate, which is what we call the MMW index. And MMW stands for Money Metric Welfare Index. And then I will talk about what you can identify, uh, and I will give you some empirical results. Let's start with also decision. Yes. Yes, and again, I mean, in principle, you know, you can, uh, I mean, which is another old debate of the inequality that we should not look at inequality now, we should look at inequality of lifetime utilities or things like this. Now, in principle, this kind of framework, it could be extended. We don't do it. And identification is much more of a problem. But identification is, is more of a problem if you use the dynamic version, even when you look at, at couples. You know, even without opening the black box of the household, you're, but, but in principle, you're exactly right. I'll, I'm, I'm not going to do it here. But. So what kind of model? I have public goods, capital N of them. I have private goods. So uh, here I is the index of the commodity, and A is the index of the agent. I will mostly talk about couples, but the model applied to, to, uh, to families with any number of people. And so what, that's, that's what we call an allocation. Preferences, I'm going to use egoistic utility. You can, you can use uh, altruistic or caring utility of this type. Essentially, what I'm assuming is efficiency, and anything that's efficient with those utilities must be efficient with those. So the, so the, the restriction I'm going to use would work in any case. Uh, 
the utilities are ordinarily defined. I'm just looking at preferences. In particular, there might, first of all, I'm not assuming that that's, that's the utility that you have when you're married. I'm not assuming that it's the same as what you would have if you were single. And second, the utility, the level of utility that you get might be increased by the simple fact that you're married. Uh, I'm just looking at preferences. So I don't want to forbid the level of utility to be a function of whether you're married or not. Efficiency means that there exists Pareto weight and you're maximizing a weighted sum of Pareto weights. Now, what about those weights? They might be constant. If they, if they are constant, then it's a unitary, particular version of the unitary model. But they might depend on anything. They might depend on prices. They might depend on incomes. Yes? How hard is the warranty efficiency? Huh? How hard is the warranty efficiency? Is that a philosophical question? No, or? I'm saying that, you know, when I tell something about whether the problems of public information can be pervasive, so, I will give money to my kids, that's what I'm saying. If that's so if you're, have, if, you, if you're asking me, in life, is there asymmetric information in family relationships? That's a general question. Now, one thing I can tell you is, this is testable. In other words, if you're willing to take that to data, I can give you a set of necessary and sufficient condition on the structure of demand function that will be satisfied. So if you aren't satisfied, it might be that if it, it must be that efficiency is violated. By the way, what I will call identification is the only thing I can observe is demand functions. Can I recover? Uh, it's, identi it's, it's not exactly identification. It's identifiability in the, in the vocabulary of Koopmans. In other words, uh, it's the kind of question I'm going to ask is exactly the same as in the unitary framework. If you give me the demand, can you recover the preferences? And the answer is yes. Uh, there is a different question, which is if I have not a perfect demand function, but, but data with measured with error and so on and so forth, the, the, there is a statistical inference problem that I'm not going to talk about. Time missing. It's not that it's not important, but I won't have time to talk about this. Yes? There is a paper out there that, in my mind, seems to cover a lot of the same territory. And uh, I was just wondering, in what sense, it, obviously, it must fail in some way to deal with the issues that you're interested in. But these insights, at least. Oh, I'm going to talk a lot about these insights. Okay. Yes, yeah, yeah, no, that's absolutely relevant. And actually, I'm concluding, time permitting, on a graph uh, from the Lees and Science paper. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I have in mind. Um, OK. Two notions. One is the notion of collective indirect utility. Conceptually, it's very simple. Those people, they make decisions. They have a, a decision-making rule. I don't know what it is. The only th assumption I'm making is efficient, but of course, there are zillions of efficient, Pareto efficient rules. But uh, given the price of the private and the public good, those are the vectors, given the total income, given those D that I will talk about in a minute, uh, and given the way they make decisions, whatever that be, they, they will end up with a vector of public consumption. They will end up with a, a, private, a vector of private consumption for each person. There will be the utility. That's what I call the indirect utility of Mr. A or Mrs. A. The indirect utility of, of person A is the utility that, at the end of the day, this person is receiving. This is not the standard indirect utility because it depends not only on your preferences here, but also the whole decision process, including the, the other person's preferences, because those guys are endogenous. So that's why, why, why I call them a collective indirect utility. And then there is a notion of distribution factors, but I don't think I will have time to talk about this, so let me skip that for a moment. Now let me start with a simple case, the conceptually simple case. It, it so happens that the conceptually simple case is the, the worst case in terms of identification and conversely. But let's, let's take a talk about just conceptual issues. Let's assume that all commodities are private. In that case, things are very simple. Why? Because efficiency is equivalent to a two-stage decision process. So forget about efficiency. Assume the way people make decisions is the following. Two stage. Stage one, there is this money on the table. They split it. Some, some, something goes to the, to the husband, and what's, whatever is left goes to the wife. So <coughs> row A goes to the wife, row B uh, goes to the husband, and of course, the, those quantities add up to total income. Stage two, with this money, they do whatever they want. This is equivalent to efficiency. And by the way, that's not a surprise. It's called the second welfare theorem, right? Now, in a world like this, you assume efficiency is just equivalent to assuming the existence of a sharing rule. And then you want to measure inequality, just look at this. You know, the perfect measure of inequality is how much is he, is he spending, how much is he spending. Now, in practice, it may not be that they, they, you know, that they transfer money. It could be that you know, uh, I, I do the shopping. And, but but, but the, conceptually, there, there is no ambiguity here. Uh, OK, so that's. 
the nice thing, of course, the, the conceptual problem starts with public goods. So let's start to think about public goods. And here I will introduce three notions, and I will try to convince you that neither the first nor the second are completely satisfactory, but that, that, that will be easy. But the third one is satisfactory, which, is, which might be more difficult. But. So the first one, which, which is, I think, not satisfactory, it's a notion that was introduced in the paper with Richard and Costas. Yes. Yeah. How do you measure inequality? Yes. Yes, essentially I will say instead of a couple, I, I have two individuals and I, I treat them exactly if they were two singles and they uh, and, and, and that's how I measure inequality. Now it's not interesting because the reason why they are married is precisely presumably that because they are public goods and because you know Of course, and not, I mean, there is little hope that by introducing household I will simplify other problems, but at least if I can. Yeah, it's consumption in my case. It's the, it's the total amount of consumption. Yeah, there are the old problem, there are the dynamic problems and so on and so forth. But, but uh, so let me come back to the situation where you have public good. First of all, one thing that's equivalent, no, no, that's, that's implied by efficiency is the following. It's still a two-stage process. The two-stage two process is slightly different. Stage one, we sit at the table and we decide how much we spend on public good. And so there will be money left. And then how do we split this money between the husband and the wife? So again, now I call what she gets rho tilde A what he gets row tilde B, but of course now they don't add up to income, they add up to income minus the amount of public good that they have decided. And at stage two, everybody does whatever he or she wants using the private consumption. It's conditional because what you're maximizing is a function that depends on the level of public good that you have decided up front, okay? So one way of measuring inequality would be, let's look at those guys here. And of course that's not satisfactory, because here I'm simply ignoring public consumption, and I don't want to ignore con public consumption. In particular, the kind of thing I have in mind is, think of a situation in which a large fraction of the household uh, budget goes on public good, and the husband and the wife have completely different evaluation of the, of the public good. The, the, let's say the wife cares much more for the public good than the husband. Then you don't want to measure only private consumption because you're missing most of the story. So that's one concept, and it doesn't work. We agree on this. This is a bit more serious. Another way of decentralizing, and that's equivalent to Pareto efficiency, that's an old idea of public economics, is I can use Lindahl prices. Now, what's the story of Lindahl prices? Now, uh, for the public good, I'm defining personal prices. So look at the budget constraints. So it's each person will, the, the income, Y, will be split between individuals. So now the, those row star add up to y. And then each person, A, is, is faced with a budget constraint in which sh uh, she chooses the quantity of the private good and she pays it at the market price. And then she doesn't choose the quantity of the public good, or she, everybody will choose the same quantity of the public good, but she pays it at a personal price. Mm -hmm. And we know that this is equivalent to efficiency. Any efficient allocation can be decentralized using, uh, using Lindahl prices. Conversely, if you take any set of prices that add up, the efficiency condition is that the sum of individual prices should be the market price. If that's the case, then the outcome will be uh, efficient. So one thing you could think of is, let's look at this. This is a good candidate for inequality, right? Because that's the value of how much they're going to spend at the end of the day. Still, there is a problem, which is they don't pay the same price. Now, why is it a problem? Assume that I find zero inequality. Assume that I find that they have exactly the same amount. But she pays a much larger price than he does, which simply means that she, sure, she cares more about the public good than he does, that you know, the price is the marginal willingness to pay at equilibrium. Then you cannot conclude that there is zero inequality, because if two people have the same income 
and they buy the same set of commodities, but one person pays a higher price than the other, in a sense, the person who pays a higher price is worse off in some sense. So, what's, what's the <coughs> Let me put it, uh, think in terms of welfare. So assume that those people, they have exactly, uh, well, put yourself in two different situations. One situation is you have an income of 10 and you buy five, five commodities, the price of the fifth commodity is two. You put yourself in exactly the same situation, you still have an income of 10, but the price of the fifth commodity is one. Would you say that you're in exactly as well off in the, in the two situations? I would say no, but again, that's, that's really a philosophical issue. So you mean you're a, I would say saying that if you and I have exactly the same income, but everything I buy, I pay more than you do, we're not yeah, equal. It's not it's just a good. Yeah, but it's the public good. But you know, the, the, the expenditures on public good can be 90% of total expenditures. Could but be everything. Oh, of course. So of course. I mean, in that sense, yeah, because your value is twice more. Yeah, but you could say, it. since I value it more, I pay more. That's fine. That's, that's what it should be, but I should be compensated for that. Equality means. Nobody can compensate. Let, let me start, let me restate it slightly differently and then we come back to the discussion, but assume that I ask myself, if you give me this number here, uh, can you find my utility? And the answer is no. If I give you this number, there is no way you can find the level of utility I'm going to reach unless you know the, utili the utility function of my partner. In other words, if, you, if I'm telling Mrs. Y is receiving a row star A of 10, you cannot infer from this, from this information, even if you know the market prices and everything, you cannot infer from this information the level of utility reached by Mrs. A because you need to know who the partner is. Because the only way you, 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 you can know the price, that she's pay, the price that she's paying depends on who the partner is. And I would like something that does not depend on that. That, that's an alternative definition. You know what? Why don't I move to my third definition and then we might come back on whether you prefer the third one or the second one. And then I will give you, I move to the third definition, I give you an example, and then once we have the example, we, we come back to the, to the discussion. How much time do I have? 27, 40, oh, that's great. That's my definition, our definition. That's the money metric welfare index. So, the right hand side is the indirect utility. So at the end of the day, my utility will depend on the row star that I just defined, on the price I pay for the private good, which is the market price, and on my personal price for the public good, right? That's my utility. What I'm saying is, how much money should I need to get exactly the same utility level if I was to pay the public good at the full value? One remark, if I, add, which I don't want to do at that point, but if I was to add the following assumption, your utility is the same when you're married as when you're single, then the natural interpretation would be how much would you need as a single to have the same utility as the level of utility that you currently have in the household. And that will be the notion of indifferent scale that we have in a paper with uh, Martin Browning and, uh, and Arthur Lubel. But I don't need this assumption. I don't need to compare my utility when single with my utility when in a couple. I'm using the same utility function, which is the one I had at a couple, but I ask myself, that's an hypothetical experiment, a thought experiment, assume that instead of paying a personal price, I was to pay the full market price. How much money would I need to reach this? And that's what, I, what we suggest to use as the measure of inequality. We compare MA with MB. In other words, what I'm doing here is the following. The main problem I, I had with the previous one is that those people were not paying the same price. Why don't, you, don't, why don't we use a monometric equivalent by transforming everything to a common set of price, which could be anything, but it makes a lot of sense uh, using the market prices. You might, by the way, instead of P, if you have two people, you could put P over two or something like this. It doesn't, doesn't matter. But the point is, I want to refer everybody to the same set of prices. Let me show you. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. 
families. Absolutely. Uh, even within families. Even Starting within, within families. families. So let me give you an example. That's exactly right. So I take the simplest possible example. Two commodities, one private good, one public good. Uh, Cobb Douglas, the coefficients add up to one. So, you know, those utilities are pretty much the same, except that I have two coefficients. <laughs> and in practice, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a two here and a one half here. So the wife put two thirds. The, the, the weight the wife puts on the public good is twice what she puts on the private good, and the husband is the opposite. He puts, puts two thirds on the private good and one third on the, on the public good. Okay? Now, you can do the computation, you can compute the indirect utility, you can compute the demand function. Uh, of course, everything depends on you, depends on which of the Pareto efficient allocation you're choosing. And I'm going to make my life simple by assuming mu equal to 1. In a sense, this sounds like a lot, very symmetric. I have Cobb Douglas, the coefficients add up to 1, and I put, uh, I put the same Pareto weight on everybody, right? And now let's look what. So those are the concepts. Uh, you know, you can trust me on the computations, but let's, let's see what it gives. So mu equal 1, alpha 2, beta equal 0.5. Here is what the structure of consumption looks like. 50% uh, of the resources are spent on the public good. And on the remaining 50%, two-thirds are spent on the husband's private consumption and one-third on the wife's private consumption. That's that what you get with a mu equal to 1. Okay? Now, if you look at the first concept, you would say there is a huge inequality. I'm not looking at public consumption. He's consuming twice as much as she does in terms of private consumption. Huge inequality, a ratio, one, uh, a ratio of two. Of course, that's not very satisfactory. Let's look at the other one. Well, the other one, it's you, there is no inequality. They receive the same amount. But she pays twice, twice as much as uh, he does, which is simply reflecting the fact that he, she cares much more about the public good than, than he does. Now, it's a bit more complex because the marginal, risk of the marginal willingness to pay depends not only on how much you care, but also how much you get of the private consumption. And she gets less, but still she's paying more because the third concept, you get this. So you, you're saying there is some inequality. This is not exactly equal because despite the fact that they have the same amount, she has to pay more. And by the way, there is a one-to-one -one relationship between this number here and our utility. If you're telling me the, or the, the, the money metric welfare index of the wife is that much, I can tell you what her utility is, and I don't need to know who the husband is. Because there is a one-to-one -one correspondence. Yeah. Yeah, no, there is no production. Now, you could put uh, household production. You can do it. You will have to trust me. Now, there are two questions uh, in what you say. One is, can I put production function? The answer is yes, I can. And I have, can have production function mm -hmm. in which the outcome is a public good that I could do. There is another aspect. Tell me if I'm right, if I'm understanding you, which is uh, what the value of leisure. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's a tricky one. And also there's a conceptual problem, which is why is she washing the dishes? And that's no, no, it's e no, no. It's if she washes the dishes because it's efficient given the break to weight, this kind of model, right? So, uh, no, in terms of measurement, no, I mean, in terms of measurement, here is a question which, which, which is exactly in the line of what you say. Think they are only private goods, but one of the private goods is leisure, and his wage is twice her wage. It means that de facto you're considering that one hour of leisure for the husband has a value which is twice one hour of leisure from the wife. Do I want to do that? It's not obvious. But, but I would say that, that what logically, as economists, we should do, because what the way I'm measuring the value of one hour of leisure is how much consumption am I, am I giving up by, by, uh, by taking this. It's not completely obvious that I should. And that's implicit in your question that, you know. Uh, Yes. Now, in principle, all those coefficients, all, all those concepts, uh, one of the commodity could be leisure. But uh, there is a concept. The definition works. The, sim the simple thing is when I make a big fuss about the, 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 they are not paying the same price, definitely for leisure, they are not paying the same price. And we seem to believe that it's acceptable. Yeah, but time use, you can put production. Now, you have to trust me on this, but you can put production here. It's not the, the fact that there is production is not a problem. The value of leisure is the problem. Yeah. 
John. I thought there was another uh, issue in what Bernard raised was uh, why, why, why is there inequality in, in the first place? So if they, and, and one theory might be that there's some benefit that uh, pizzazz, I guess, that the uh, uh, wife is getting that she's uh, paying for by doing dishes. It, there, so, so inequality measure here then. Yeah. One story could be my utility, uh, the utility that derived from marrying my wife is so large that despite the fact that I have a, a zero consumption, I'm very happy. Should I take that into account in inequality? Inequality people do not. They have a very strict response on this. We are measuring inequality of income or inequality of consumption. They are not measuring inequality of welfare. Well, that's where they run a foul of welfare. Right. I mean, that's a, and the social, whole social preference literature is screwed up on the same thing. Oh. So we, we've either got to be consistent in our welfare economics axioms or kowtow to that kind of nonsense. I completely agree with this, but what the typical response from, uh, from inequality people would be to say, yes, but we cannot measure welfare. Worse than this, we cannot compare welfare. We don't have the tools that would allow us interpersonal comparison of welfare. At least, com com at least consumption we can we can uh, we can compare consumption. But, that, but that's just a vestige of you know what are the minimal assumptions we need to generate demand curves. The oh. fact that I mean this is these are old long debates well for economics. If you yeah. want to compare welfare, you make assumptions and you make them comparable. Yes. I mean I, I, I think it's almost impossible to do equity analysis without some comparability of welfare. Of you you will see that what you say is exactly right. I fully agree, and actually it's even worse here. In the, in, in a minute, I will I will show you that. You have exactly this kind of problem in a kind of twisted way that comes, that comes out. Uh, but let me, here is, just to be, to be fair, here is a classical counterexample in the literature on inequality. It's uh, Shylock versus Mother Teresa. You know, and if you compare welfare, you should take uh, money away from Mother Teresa because her utility will not decrease and uh, give it to Shylock because despite the fact that he's incredibly rich, this additional dollar will, will, will cause such a pleasure for him that, that he should receive money. That's the kind of paradox you get when you, when you, you don't want to advocate that the greediest people should, should get more money just f as a reward of the fact that they're greedy. But again, I, mean, I don't want to enter there because, uh, and believe me, we, we gave, I gave this paper at the, at the, at the handbook presentation. They were so basically all the inequality people in the, on the planet were in the room and they started discussing between them about those issues and uh, you know I don't want to enter there. I'm not competent enough. But I'm, at least that's a concept which in a sense goes in the right direction. I fully agree that it doesn't solve all the problem but I think it's better than the, than the alternatives. Whatever. Yes. So we see allocations we don't see it in Sorry? We see allocations. We don't see parameters. We might parameters. Oh, so you're, you're asking about identification? <laughs> yeah. so, I'm, go, I'm going to come to identification in a minute. Now, but is it about identification? or uh, Identification is coming. You're, you're right. Identification is the crucial point, and I'm, I'm moving to that. Before that, let me mention a line of research. Uh, because I think that, in particular, this, this idea of inequality within the household in developing countries that's something, not, not exactly this paper, so this is a paper with uh, Browning, Martin Browning and Arthur Lubell, but uh, uh, an offspring of this paper, which is a paper by uh, um, Duncan uh, Pendecoris Lubell, I think it's a beautiful advance in the literature uh, of uh, intra-household inequality, especially for developing countries. I, I will talk about that later. But let me tell you what the general idea is. There is an extreme situation, which is a kind of... A, here we sort of take a theoretical stand. It's not really that we believe it, but let's try to push assumptions as far as we can. Here is the stand that we take. Let's assume that your utilities are exactly the same whether you're married or single. That doesn't change. What does change is that if you're married, you have access to a technology which is quite different. And this is, it, in a sense, it's Becker, the Beckerian uh, idea of household production, except that it's not only production in the sense that you're, you have to wash the dishes. It's this, and it's also the fact that the, there is some, some way of processing consumption in general uh, that transform what you buy and what you consume. And this process, now this, this process, if you're a single, it's, it may be there, but it's completely undistinguishable from a standard utility function. But when you have a couple, the technology might be different. Now in practice, in general, what you say is this is what you buy, this is what you consume. 
uh, and there is a linear technology, the kind of intuition that you get, and, and actually this used to be called Barton scales, the, the, the kind of intuition that you get, which is sort of powerful, is something like the natural translation of a public good is that the price you pay is more. And if there is a public good, you, you, you need a smaller price. It's not exactly, that's not exactly a public good technology, it's the private good technology with economies of scales. So there is a subtle distinction here, but that's one way. I'll come back to that for the empirical application. Now, let's talk about identification. I distinguish, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about, well, I'm going to talk about the first two. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to have time to talk about this, but that, that's a paper that Johan will present tomorrow. But um, what do I, there is pure identification in the collective model and single and couples. Now, pure identification in the collective model, uh, I'm, I'll talk about the following question. Assume that you observe a demand function. Demand function, I mean, you observe the demand for each and every commodity as a function of price and income. The aggregate demand, the aggregate demand at household level. What I don't observe is who is consuming what as in a household. For the private good, for the public good, everybody consumes everything. Uh, and of course, for the public good, I don't observe the marginal willingness is to pay. Right? So the, the household is a black box. I observe a demand function, which is a function of price and income. Can I recover preferences and the sharing order? I'm not assuming anything about the relationship between your utility when you're married and your utility when you're single. They might be completely different. They might have zero correlation. The second is, what do I buy? How much mileage can I get if, in addition, I'm willing to make the assumption that your preferences when you're, when you're uh, single have something to do with your preferences when you're married? And of course, that, that's going to give me a lot of identification power because, because then I can use data on single and try controlling for selection biases and everything, try to use them. And then uh, the third one is, uh, we can, instead of just looking at what people do and trying to infer the inequality from that, I could be a little bit more ambitious and try to write a model which will theoretically predict what the distribution of intra-household consumption should be, for instance, as stemming from the equilibrium condition. And that's exactly the kind of paper that will be presented tomorrow, so this I'm not going to talk about this. And if I have time, I will show you some empirical results. Now, this is the basic result of all this literature. The one thing I need is one exclusion restriction per agent, which means for each agent, there is a commodity that this agent is not consuming, that just does not enter the utility function of this agent. If you're willing to make this assumption, then you exactly identify the collective indirect utility. That's the main reason. That's not all of it, because now the next step is if you have the collective indirect utility, can you recover? the consumption themselves, right? But, uh, but now this, I'm not going to give you the proof, but uh, I can give you references. Now, the cool thing is that if you have public goods, that's great because you don't need more than this. Because the, the indirect utility, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the collective indirect utility and the direct utility. So it means that if everything is public, if I just look at the demand function, I can observe, I can identify, and I have this exclusion restriction, which is here that A does not consume commodity two and B does not consume commodity one. Then I can identify utilities, I can exactly identify Lindahl prices, and I can exactly identify MMWIs. It's not a piece of cake because I need price variation. Of course, if I want to identify utilities, I need price variation, so you need, you know, you need the price variation have to be exogenous, and I have all the, the usual problems of consumer demand, but at least I have a very strong identifiability result. So what kind of data do you have in mind? Any kind of data in which you have price variations. You know, that are those people. <laughs> Actually, well, there are plenty of, of uh, there are plenty of, um, of data. Well, uh, I, will, I will show you some, but there are plenty of data in, uh, in developing countries in which you, uh, you observe price variation, which are due, for instance, there is just one thing that's fresh in my mind because I was discussing with Horatio Tanasio uh, last week at UCL. He has data about villages in, uh, in Colombia, and those villages are isolated, so it, it happens that there is a huge amount of price dispersion within those villages, essentially for, 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 uh, for supply reasons. So you have distribution of people, uh, and, uh, and you can observe, you have, you have the, the, basically the same set of, of commodities, but prices are widely different. Well, yes, uh, of course. So you need something like you need, you know, you need an identifying restriction, which would be in that case 
the distribution of the, the, the heterogeneity in tests is orthogonal to the heterogeneity in prices. Let me give you another example. A student of mine did some work on Turkish data. And those Turkish data were collected in a period of uh, hyperinflation. So you can have fa families randomly selected in the same part of Istanbul, but some of them were interviewed in January, some of them were interviewed in November, and it so happened that the relative scale, the relative prices are completely different just because inflation not only increases all prices, but changes a lot the relative prices. So, you know, again, is this exogenous? The, the, the best thing would be you run an experiment and you, 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 sell, you sell different commodities at different Maybe. prices. So, for example, for a kid, uh, you need a market for that, right? It must to enter in a budget constraint for the family, at least. Yes. You need price variability, then in the budget constraint, and you can buy a kid more or less. Yes. But the valuation must be through the budget constraint, maybe, right? I mean. Yeah, well, but you know, that's literature on inequality. We're talking about consumption, and how do you evaluate consumption? You use market prices. I mean, that's. I'm not the saying that I'm going to solve here. So the um, price for the kid. Oh, for the kids. What do you mean for the kids? So, I mean, I understand that you can decide to have a kid or not depending on, you know, certain characteristics like taxes, how costly is within the family. But the price variability that generates demand for this public good that is a kid. Is oh, no, no, no. But in that case, you know, you, you, here I would not treat, uh, treat the kid for a, uh, as, a, as a public good. I would treat the kid as a decision maker and I will try to look what, ah. how, much, how much he consumes. Oh, no, no, sorry. I, I, I misunderstood your question. Okay. I will show you the, the Malawi data by uh, Dunbar... Uh, Lubel and Pendecor, that, that's what they do. What? No, no, yes, it, it needs not be a decision. I mean, is an individual, whether he's a, de a decision maker or not, depends on the price, whether the price to weight is the same as, as you know, we, we know technically how to do that. Now, the problem is really with the private goods. Why that? Let me take the simplest possible example. I have three commodities. One is consumed exclusively by person A, two is consumed exclusively by person B, and three is consumed by both, and I don't observe individual consumption, okay? Uh, I want to recover the utility of A, which doesn't depend on Q2, the utility of B, which doesn't depend on Q1. I want to, to recover Q3A and Q3B that I don't observe, and I want to observe the sharing rule. Of course, it's equivalent. Observing this guy is equivalent to observing that, right? The answer is this is not identified. It's never identified. The best I can do is identify up to an additive constant. What's the intuition? Assume that I have a solution, which I call U bar A, U bar B, rho bar. Okay? I'm going to construct an alternative solution. And the way I constructed it, let me tell you in, in English what this means. To construct my alternative solution, I take the initial solution. And in each and every situation, I, I give k additional unit of commodity 3 to, uh, say, the husband. Now, of course, if I keep utility constant, that will change everything. So I have to adjust the utility. And the way I adjust the utility is by saying, but wait, with those k additional units, I'm changing his utility in such a way that his level of utility is exactly the same as before. OK? That I can always do. In practice, what it means is this that if I'm starting from this situation, I have Q1 here, I have Q3 here, I'm shifting what he gets by amount of k, whatever. It's a vertical shift of k, whatever the slope, whatever the, the intercept, but I'm doing exactly the same with the indifference curves. Those two solutions are indistinguishable. If one is a solution, the other one is, is also. Now, the paradox here is that in the end, I don't care. Because what I just told you is the utility is the same. If I'm interested in welfare, I could not care less about the K. Because the way I've constructed my, my UK utility is by saying, but wait, he receives less, but his, his preferences are different. Therefore, his utility is unaffected. So coming back to the discussion we had before, if the only thing I care, I care is welfare, I just ignore the K. But the, the inequality people don't want to ignore the K. Inequality people tell you what I care is how much is consumed. And how much is consumed? in some sense, is not identified. So coming back to this whole question that I mentioned, uh, what are we interested in, inequality on consumption or inequality in welfare? This is a situation in which if you're, if you're interested in inequality in welfare, the model is identified. Well, it's identified up to the usual problem that you don't have interpersonal comparability of utility, what cardinalization of it. But you know, that, that, that thing that, that people have been talking about for, for years. But if you insist on talking about quantities, right? 
then the model is deeply not identified. Now let me briefly jump to, so you can generalize this. Uh, the situation is not that bad because those are local restrictions. If you introduce global restriction, you might actually be able to identify everything. For instance, so essentially what I'm saying is this is identified up to an additive constant. Actually, when you have many private goods, non-assignable private goods, it's uh, up to a function of those, those private goods. Now, if you have non-negative HT restriction like this, if there is no income, no one can consume anything. Then you pin down everything. But that's, that's really identifying from the, from the corner solution. Now, this is the key to something which is, those of you who are familiar with the literature to reveal preference. Uh, that there is a paradox here because we identify up to a constant, whereas they identify much better than this. They identify up to bounds, and in some cases, the bounds are extremely narrow. There is a recent paper by Churchier, De Rock, um, uh, Lubel, and Vermeulen in which they, they, they do that on penal data, and they, they identify very narrow bounds. Uh, but of course, it's because when you do reveal preferences, you're not local. By definition, you're using a global tool, and, and so global restriction might help you. You may or may not believe this. Essentially, what I'm saying is I'm going to identify what's going on for large income levels uh, out of a condition which explains what would happen if the income was, was driven to zero. I have to, uh, to be very conf confident in my functional form. There is a literature in which, in addition, so that's identification if you don't want to make assumption relating the utility when single with the utility when married. If you're willing to do that, then there is a literature. Uh, so there is an issue of selection into marriage, and there is a, an, an issue of change in preferences. There are plenty of solutions. Uh, you, can, you can assume, for instance, that part of the utility remains unaffected, that part of the utility is changed by the fact that you married, but another part is not changed, and that's what you identify. And that the, the initial version of the Lees and Sites paper, that's what, that's what they were doing. Uh, or you can use the household technology. I didn't say a, a word about this, and then I will give you a, a, a bunch of graphs just to convince you not to run out before the end of my talk. The graphs are cool, actually. Uh, but before that, you have to, to swallow this. Um, so the, the, when, you when you take the household technology, so remember, the idea here is my utility is exactly the same as, as when I was single. So if you want to identify my utility function, just look at the a clone of me who happens to be single. Happens to meaning that you know, I have a way of, of dealing with selection. And uh, you, you, you identify from his demand function, and then you use this. But there is something in between, which is when I am in a couple, I have access to the new technology. Is the new technology identifiable? Now, the answer is that the technology is identified in a strong sense, non-parametrically. Uh, but you have a price to pay. And the, the paper, this, this paper, which actually is, is forthcoming, but uh, you have to assume uh, exactly identical preferences when single and when married, which is a strong assumption. You need price variations, which makes your life miserable. Uh, and you need to be able to observe singles. Now, observing singles, when you're talking about men and women, you can presumably identify the demand function of a single. When you have children, it's much more difficult. You don't observe the demand function of single kids. And then you have a demanding estimation process. Now, there is this absolutely beautiful. Could you repeat a bit about the kids? What is it you don't see? Sorry? When you have kids, you the problem is I need to use uh, the, 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 the I need to identify the utility of each person from data when this person was single. I can do that with the husband, I can do that with the wife, I can hardly do that with kids because I don't observe the demand function of, of, of a kid by himself. Now there is a beautiful paper, a paper that I really love by, by Dunbar, Lubel, and Pendacor. And what they're doing is they, they're using exactly this technology, but they're adding an assumption which is completely standard in the equivalent scale literature and in the development literature, which is independence of scale, which is something like the division of resources within the household, the proportion that goes to the husband and the proportion that goes to the wife does not depend on the level of income. On the? Which, on the level of income. So essentially, if it's 40, it depends on prices. It depends on the bargaining position. It depends on whatever you want, but there is no systematic impact of income, which, by the way, is not rejected by the data. That's something that we, you can test even in the general in the general framework, and it's not rejected by the data. But if you make this assumption, then you can relax a lot. The only thing you need in their paper, in the published paper in the AAR, is 
you need that the preference, some part of the utility function, which has to do with the preference for adult goods, that not depend on the number of children. It might depend on the presence of children, but not on the number of children. And actually, they can relax that. Now, if you're willing to make this, uh, this assumption and you have a distribution factor, you also get identification. But in that case, you identify everything, not up to a constant. You identify everything. OK, you're welcome to, uh, this is something like uh, that I'm not going to talk about. Uh, so the graphs, that's these insights. That's the graph that you see usually. So that's, that's, the, that's the evolution of inequality in the UK between 70 and 2000 using the variance of log consumption as an indicator. This is between households. And you, that's what you usually see and the conclusion is there is there's been a huge increase in inequality. But that's their estimate of the, uh, of the inequality or the evolution of inequality within the household. And when you Add up and it declined a lot. Why that? Or for reasons that are obvious for everyone here. Because women are working more and they have higher wages. And those, the, this kind of model, what comes out very strongly from this kind of model is that the, what she gets depends a lot on her wage. So if you increase her wage a lot, she will be much more powerful and she will attract a larger fraction, which you can see. Uh, and when you do this estimate and you add up, you find that actually the total inequality, first of all, is much larger than what you thought. That's not surprising, because there is an additional layer that you are not considering, which is the intra-household inequality. But in addition, it did not change much over the period. It's, it so happened that the, the increase in inequality across was exactly compensated by the decrease in inequality within. Do they, do they have for children? Yeah, they, they do, but they are, now it's not completely clean, because they have public good, which you can think of as children. But they use the, actually, my method one. They use the private consumption. They should redo it using MMWIs, and uh, or we might do that. I mean, but that's the table by Dubar, uh, Dunbar Lubel Pendacour. Um, and I will stop there. And let me tell you what this is. Those are a very poor household in Malawi one child, two children, three children, four children. They have a structural model. They identify, they show, they identify, they do plenty of things. But let me give you the, the results. This number here is the percentage of those households below the poverty level. And this is the standard kind of analysis. You look at the, the income or the total consumption of the household. You got those equivalent scales, which, by the way, are very poorly defined. Are, are, uh, but you know that, that's what the, the paper with uh, with Browning and, and Dubel were there. But anyway, you're using this and you compute how, how many of those households are below the threshold. With their technology, they can do that for each and every person who's in the household. Now, what you say is that when you're saying 85% of those, of those households are below the poverty level, in truth, the picture is quite different. The husband, only, only less than 70% are below the, below the poverty level. But for kids, it's 95%. And also, you can see what happens when you increase the number of children, and you see that the amount, the percentage of, of husband basically doesn't change. What changes a lot is the percentage of women and the percentage of, of children. You know, you got this 9.99. Uh, so it tells you a very, you know, speaking story about inequality within a household. And the last one is something that, that Yoram was going to talk about tomorrow. I'm done. Well, and this, this is irrelevant. Thank you.